Perennials are one of the best ways to express yourself in the garden. The textures and colors, well, they're just endless. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Join me as we explore some of the most beautiful perennials for your garden. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. This is the time of year I get so excited about my garden because it's so full of color. And you know, just walking through it, I realized that so much of the color comes from perennials. So in today's show, I thought we'd showcase some really spectacular plants and take a look at an outstanding garden in England. We'll take a tour of the breathtakingly beautiful perennial borders at Arley Hall and we'll visit with a very charming woman whose collection of daylilies exceeds 1,300 different varieties. The colors are out of this world. And while we're on the subject of daylilies, I'll share some tips on separating these beauties and spreading them all over your garden to create an unforgettable effect. Plus, the color doesn't stop here. We'll meet a salvia enthusiast who has a collection that exceeds well beyond the average plant collection. And we'll take a look at one of my favorite plants, Columbine origami. I have some planting tips to share, plus some ideas on mixing this beauty with other plants. And oh yeah, what about pizza? Well, it's a perennial favorite, isn't it? I've got a great tasting strawberry pizza recipe that you're gonna wanna try. But first, let's take a tour of some of the most beautiful perennial borders in the world. We'll tour England's famous Arley Hall when we come back, so don't go away. Welcome back. Maybe you have a favorite flower. Most gardeners do. But I have to say, as a professional garden designer, I can't just choose one because there's so many beautiful flowers to choose from. Whether the blooms come from annuals, bulbs, or perennials, I like them all. And there's no place that combines the beauty of all these than the historic herbaceous perennial borders at Arley Hall in the heart of Cheshire, England. These are some of the oldest perennial borders in the country. They date back to the 1840s. Can you imagine? These flower beds have been here for over 150 years. Now what's interesting about them is that many of the plants, the perennials, are actually North American natives. There are beautiful flowers such as goldenrod, purple coneflower, verbascum, asters, and the impressive Joe pie weed. You see, what I find interesting is that so often, our native plants have to go abroad to be appreciated. It's always such an inspiration for me to visit beautiful gardens like these. I always leave with new ideas. I learn new plants and ways to combine them. Perennials are a very diverse group. Some will grow in very arid conditions, while others will literally grow in standing water. I hope you've been inspired to experiment and have a little fun with new varieties of perennials in your own garden. If you're fortunate enough to have a flower farm such as this one in your area, you can learn a lot about how a particular flower will perform. And if you're looking for a sun-loving perennial, you'll find that this one is hard to beat. If you have full sun, I'd recommend daylilies. They are the easiest to grow, and uh, I have th approximately 1,300 different varieties. And they bloom, uh, they bloom early and mid-season and late. Sybil Sims has been growing and selling this popular flower to the public for over 35 years. Well, I think the Stellas are the, for the beginner, because it blooms a lot in the summer, and uh, the Stellas are real pretty. They, they will, they're yellow, and they go with a lot of different colors. Now, you sell a lot of daylilies each season. Tell me how you, how you sell them. Uh, I choose three days. Uh, when I think they're at the peak of their bloom. And then I have my show, and uh, I have people to come out and pick out the lilies they like. And that way, uh, they see what they're getting, and they can uh, uh, come back and get them when I dig them, and they can put them out. And even if 
in the hottest part of the summer. They, they're tough and they'll survive. Well, there are thousands and thousands of varieties. That's right, they are, and each year there's more. I had rather have a flower than a new dress. <laughs> For me, the best value in plants is generally determined by three factors. I want them to be low maintenance. I'd like for them to bloom for a long period of time, and I'd like for them to come back year after year. Well, I know this may sound like a tall order, but there are actually a lot of plants out there that will fill this criteria. One of the best examples is the daylily. In fact, these guys have another attribute. They can be very vigorous growers, often doubling in number from year to year, to the point that they really should be divided every three to five years to continue good blooming. I found that the late summer is an excellent time of the year to separate and transplant clumps of daylilies. By doing it now, it gives them an opportunity to settle in before shorter days and colder temperatures set in. There's really nothing to dividing daylilies. Just carefully lift the clumps with a sharp shovel and gently remove the soil from the root so you can begin to see the individual plants. Then with a knife, separate each plant and remove any foliage that appears dead or diseased. You know, it's hard to believe, but that one clump produced 10 plants. Now I'll just cut off the foliage at about half, and they're ready for transplanting back into the garden. I'll space them about 10 to 12 inches apart, put them in full sun, and keep them well watered until they're rooted in. There are so many beautiful perennials to choose from. When we come back, we'll visit another woman whose love for plants has brought together a spectacular collection of salvia. That's next, so stay with us. Over the years, I've found that certain groups or families of plants are worth knowing more about, like the salvias or sages. You see, this is a fine example of that. This is Mexican bush sage, and it comes from south of the border. I've grown it in my garden for years because of its beautiful velvet purple blooms and resistance to problems with pests. Betsy Klepsch, an expert on all salvias, an author of the aptly named A Book of Salvias, Sages for Every Garden, recently gave me a tour of her Central California garden. Betsy, how long have you been growing salvias? Oh, I've been growing salvias for so many years. I have learned over the years that deadheading is so important for salvias because it promotes keeping the weight off the plant and promoting uh, rebloom. Yeah, so by taking off those dead flowers, you're right. encouraging the plant to put forth another wave of flowers. A, a whole new wave of flowers with deadheading, you will get three to four repeat blooms on some of these plants. I mean, now, who wouldn't want to do a little maintenance? Why, sure, with those <laughs> sorts of returns. Oh, there are big returns in store. Wonderful. This yeah. is one of my favorite, indigo spires. Indigo spires was introduced quite a number of years ago, a good 20 years ago. It's a great um, plant for attracting pollinators. Oh, definitely. Oh, there are insects galore over this. An entomologist visited my garden and spent a day with me this was a few years ago, and she said that she counted over 30 species of bees. So it's alive with insects. Sure and that's it is. what makes a garden healthy. Right. And people tell me that um, butterflies are attracted by many different species of salvias, and that's a lovely thing too. Sure, not to mention the hummingbirds. Not to mention the hummingbirds. Salvias are worldwide in their distribution. There are over 900 species worldwide. Immensely diverse. Ah, so consequently, you can't lay any law down about salvias. Really, so much of this is about experimentation, isn't it? Yes, and that's what gardeners are. They're experimenters because just because you read in a book it should be done one way doesn't mean that you have to do it that way. You have to figure out what's best for your space and be willing to give a little time and thought to it. And, uh, and do what suits your tastes. Yes. In terms of color. And, and you know, you may be pleasantly surprised that you can go against a few rules and have it turn out just dandy. One of the things I'm struck by 
in, in seeing your garden for the first time is this beautiful combination of antique roses and salvias. They're, they're great companion plants. They really do work well together, don't they? Indeed. They're both pretty disease-free and floriferous and just um, good all-round plants. Is there a particular salvia that uh, comes to mind that could, um, could cross over from dry to wet conditions? Yes, there's one that I think of immediately. For the gardener who's inventive, they can grow the bog sage in a very dry area. And it comes from South America. It has a wide distribution there and must grow in very, very boggy areas. But um, we found that if you hold water off of it, then it doesn't throw up as many runners as it would if you really gave it a lot of water. It's a beautiful sky blue color, and its lower lip has a lot of white for the bees to climb on. Yes, the bumblebees uh, love the, it do in my they? garden. Yes, okay. they do. Okay. Yes. Betsy, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed your book. It's helped me to understand this vast family of plants much better. Well, I'm so glad that it's been of help. I really enjoyed writing the book. It put me in contact with many, many different people, gardeners of all different kinds from all different locations, and we just had a good time getting to know one another and discussing plants. Well, that's really what it's all about. That's what it is all about. Coming up, we'll take a look at what's new in my garden, and I'll show you a few salvia varieties I've been growing, so don't go away. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. Today we're talking about perennial favorites in the garden. And I have to say, I share Betsy's love and enthusiasm for salvias. I just brought a few in from my garden to share with you. Take this one, for instance. It's one of my favorites. It's called Indigo Spires. It's stunning in my garden, particularly late in the season. Now, if you live in a zone, say, north of Zone 7, you may have to replant this and grow it as an annual, but it's worth it. From Zone 7 South, you could regard it as a perennial. Now here's another favorite called Black and Blue. Just look at these deep, saturated colors. Now, Salvia Leucantha, I can't imagine my garden without. It blooms late in the season with these beautiful velvet-like flowers. It's called Mexican Sage and it's just a natural with grasses like this penicetum called hamlin. Just look at how these work together. They're a beautiful combination in the garden. These ornamental grasses are a natural in the garden. Many of them are perennial, but we'll have to save those for another show. Another thing that I like so much about the salvia leucantha or Mexican sage is it dries beautifully. It's so gorgeous in arrangements. And the way I dry it is I simply strip off the lower leaves like I've done here, and then I take a rubber band and just wrap it around the stems like this. And as the stems shrink, as they lose moisture, the rubber band will tighten around them and they won't slide through. And you can just hang them upside down in a cool, dry place like your garage. And in a few weeks, you can use them in dried arrangements. Give it a try. Of course, salvias perform the best in full sun locations. So what about something for the shade garden? Well, I recently came across a hybrid series of columbine called origami, and I've enjoyed trying them in my garden. You see, its flowers look like tiny starbursts with spurs extending from the backside of each blossom. When columbine's in full bloom in my garden, it always turns lots of heads. People can't help but remark on its beauty. Typically, columbine has a short period of bloom but plant breeders are working on new varieties that actually have an extended bloom season, up to 12 weeks with some varieties like this one called origami, named after the Japanese art of paper folding. Columbine comes in such a wide range of colors. Now all the hybrids that you see that are a part of this breeding program were actually derived from the wild columbine that we see growing in many parts of the country. Columbine is happiest in shade to partial shade and prefers a well-drained fertile soil. You'll want to water it regularly to keep the soil moderately moist. Now I like to combine columbine with other shade tolerant plants, such as spiderwort, Virginia sweet spire, hosta, fern. 
and variegated Solomon seal, and ground covers such as Lamium. I love coming up with these new combinations, and I have to say, I've probably learned more from my failures than I have my successes. I just kind of go at it with an open mind. Now, speaking of being open-minded, as you can see, this is no ordinary pizza. It's strawberry pizza. I'll meet you in the kitchen where we'll whip up this treat when we come back, so don't go away. Eating strawberries has always been a treat for me. I can remember picking them with my grandmother Smith when I was a kid in what seemed like a huge patch at the time. I suppose I'll always have a passion for this delicious little fruit. I can't think of a recipe using them that I don't like. This one I'm putting together today is one of my favorites. It's strawberry pizza, and you'll find that kids of all ages will love it. The crust is made of just three simple ingredients. I use two cups of flour with one cup of butter and about a half a cup of powdered sugar. Now just blend all of these together and press the dough into the bottom of a nine inch pie pan. Now don't worry about greasing the pan. Now you wanna do this until it's evenly distributed. Just bake it at 375 until golden brown. The nice thing about this recipe is that it calls for enough ingredients to make two pizzas. And once you've tasted it, you'll be glad you made two. Now for the filling, I use 16 ounces of cream cheese. You can use the light, it tastes just as good as far as I'm concerned, and one cup of sugar. Now you blend all of this together, and once the pie crusts have cooled, you spread it on them. Now for the finale. Sweeten about two and a half cups of berries with a couple of tablespoons of sugar, and add two tablespoons of cornstarch, and bring all of this to a simmer. When the mixture's thickened, remove it from the heat and let it cool and then spread this over the cream cheese filling. This follows the recipe, but I've also used fresh sliced berries on the cream cheese. Now I'll chill it and it'll be ready in about an hour. There's no question that perennials play such an important role in our gardens. In today's show, we can only scratch the surface. There's so many varieties to choose from. I encourage you to get out there and experiment and just have some fun. Now, any of the information you're interested in from today's show can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com. And I encourage you to try that strawberry pizza recipe. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't but smile 